On April 6, 1862, Confederate Brigadier General Johnson Kelly Duncan, commander of the coastal defenses on the Mississippi River south of New Orleans, reports his observations of the Union Navy Armada as 21 schooners and two gunboats, one of the latter large. At this head of the passes, eight gunboats, three steam frigates, and one schooner, Duncan relays this information to his superiors in New Orleans, believing that his men in Forts Jackson and St. Philip can withstand any attack from the Federal ships. The forts, which sit on opposite banks of the Mississippi, about 75 miles below New Orleans, stand as the last bastion of defense on the river against an approach to the city from the south. Duncan's leadership over the coming four weeks will earn him a place in Southern history as an unsung hero. But Union Navy Flag Officer David Glasgow Farragut's ultimate conquest of the Crescent City will inflict a crippling blow on the Confederacy. The state of Louisiana's preparations for the anticipated Union invasion had begun in earnest soon after South Carolina's secession in December 1860. Louisiana Governor Thomas Overton Moore took it upon himself to seize all federal property within the state including the river forts. Fort St. Philip, an irregular brick quadrilateral on the east bank, dates to the mid-1700s and had been used by U.S. forces against the British in the War of 1812. It had been upgraded about the same time Fort Jackson, a brick pentagon, was completed on the west bank in 1832. Both stand at the head of the passes, the point about 40 miles above the mouth of the Mississippi where the river current divides as it begins to enter the Gulf of Mexico. The new Confederate government realizes the vital importance of protecting the South's largest city and busiest port. The South provides three quarters of the world's cotton and 20% of Great Britain's population depends on the textile industry for its livelihood. Confederate President Jefferson Davis hopes that this economic relationship might bring the United Kingdom into the war on the southern side. Defending New Orleans is essential to that equation. An inspection of the Mississippi River force by General P.G.T. Beauregard in March 1862 at the request of the Military Board of Louisiana finds that both need strengthening. Beauregard reports that even when in proper condition for defense, they cannot prevent the passage of one or more steamers during a dark or stormy night, except with the assistance of a properly constructed raft or a strong wire rope across the river between the two forts. In the north, the Board of Strategy, a committee appointed by Secretary of the Navy Gideon Wells in 1861, names New Orleans as the primary target for invasion, but the large forces needed for this task simply do not yet exist. Wells and his assistant secretary, Gustavus V. Fox, realize as the British had some 48 years earlier that the city of New Orleans is the key to a successful invasion of the south, and that means capturing the forts at the head of the passes. To direct the Confederate defense of New Orleans, Davis assigns Major General David Twiggs, who earlier in 1861, as a federal general, had surrendered all Union forces in Texas, but age and ill health quickly compels Twiggs to retire, and the Confederate War Department recommends Major General Mansfield Lovell as his replacement. Contemporaries describe Lovell as a brilliant, energetic, and accomplished officer. Born the son of an army surgeon, General Joseph Lovell, in 1822, Mansfield Lovell became an orphan at the age of 14 and lived two years with a relative until he secured an appointment to West Point. After he graduated ninth in his class of 1842, the army assigned him to the 4th U.S. Artillery Regiment. Lovell served in the Mexican War and was wounded at Belen Gate in the conquest of Mexico City. Commanding General Zachary Taylor promoted him to captain for his gallantry in the Battle of Chapultepec and held that rank until he retired from the army in 1854. He was working as a deputy street commissioner in New York City at the outbreak of the Civil War. 
Upon assuming command of Department No. 1, Lovell requisitioned heavy guns from Richmond, Virginia and Pensacola, Florida. He notes 12 42-pounders were sent to Forts Jackson and St. Philip, together with a large additional quantity of powder, to ensure the effective use of the fort's defenses. Lovell suggests to the Confederate administrators a transplanted northerner and West Point graduate, Johnson Kelly Duncan. Born in 1827 in York, Pennsylvania, Duncan graduated from West Point in 1849. He served on the frontier and in Florida, but retired from the Army in 1855 to accept a position as a civil engineer in New Orleans. He later worked for the state of Louisiana. When hostilities broke out, Duncan offered his services to the Confederacy. Based upon his work as a colonel serving in the defenses of Mississippi and Lovell's confidence in the young engineer, Davis promoted Duncan to Brigadier General and put him in direct command of the defensive operations at the passes, with Fort Jackson as his headquarters. Aware that Forts Jackson and St. Philip stand as formidable obstacles, Secretary Wells knows he needs a strong commander to attack them, and so, on January 9, 1862, Wells appointed Flag Officer David G. Farragut as commander of the West Gulf Blockading Squadron. On January 15th, Farragut leaves Washington and makes his way to Philadelphia to meet with his second-in-command, his foster brother, Flag Officer David D. Porter. They wait for more of their mortar flotilla to arrive, and as soon as the fleet assembles, they sail to the Gulf of Mexico. After his arrival at Ship Island, Farragut receives intelligence about the layout and munitions of Forts Jackson and St. Philip. Between them, they possess 126 heavy guns. Farragut is worried about the water level of the river. A rise and fall of five feet could hamper the drafts of the larger vessels in their journey upriver during the rainy season. By early February, Farragut is waiting for the rest of the assault force to arrive before attacking. Meanwhile, Duncan and his staff arrive at Fort Jackson on March 27th. According to one of Duncan's adjutants, Captain William J. Seymour, water is seeping into the fort at an alarming rate, and the garrison has to work in dreadful conditions where the outbreak of disease seems likely. Cannons sink into the ground near the fort making it extremely difficult for the crews to move the pieces around. Despite these problems, Duncan oversees placement of the heavy guns, 74 at Fort Jackson and 52 at Fort St. Philip. The garrison at St. Philip occupies a more vulnerable position, since the area just to the rear of the fort, known as a quarantine, exposes them to an attack from behind. Tiny bayou outlets become potential avenues to outflank the fort. Throughout the fall and winter of 1861, artillery regiments served in both forts. The first battery, known as St. Mary's Cannoneers, mustered into service at Franklin, Louisiana on October 7, 1861. The Cannoneers, commanded by Captain F. O. Kearney, later proved their resilience in combat and their unwavering loyalty in times of extreme distress. With a complement of 875 men, as well as a contingent of local militia guards under Captain Giuseppe Paletti from the 6th Louisiana Regiment, European Brigade, which is actually a battalion-sized unit made up of Italian immigrants, and also Lovell's Regiment, or the 20th Louisiana Infantry, these troops entered the forts right before Farragut's assault, joining the 838 soldiers already stationed in them. Duncan's knowledge of the naval forces on the river boosts his confidence in the garrison's ability to resist a Union attack. The Confederate River Fleet consists of the Louisiana State Naval Vessels, General Quitman, and Governor Moore, along with the CSS McRae, the ironclad CSS Louisiana, and the steam ram ironclad CSS Manassas. Duncan stresses that Louisiana needs to play an important part in the defense. The CSS Louisiana's outer shell is already completed, but its engines need maintenance. Duncan hopes to use the ironclad as a floating battery if its engines cannot be ready in time. 
Commodore William C. Whittle, commander of the naval forces on the Mississippi River, places Captain John K. Mitchell in charge of the Confederate gunboats. Although Mitchell has a reputation as a competent naval commander, he occasionally seems hesitant when it comes to making critical decisions. Confederate Secretary of the Navy Stephen R. Mallory agrees with Duncan's assessment that the superiority of the Union ships can be neutralized with the use of ironclads that could drive away the wooden blockading vessels. Mallory foresees the importance of the ironclad, especially when the stranglehold of the Union Navy begins to tighten around southern ports, stating, such a vessel at this time could traverse the entire coast of the United States and prevent all blockades. On March 28th, a Union reconnaissance party observes a large chain boom stretching from one side of the river to the other. The party also discovers huge rafts that had been soaked with turpentine. Upon hearing that report, Federal commanders surmise that the Confederate defenders will use the rafts to light the river to hamper a night attack, or perhaps let the current take them downriver to ignite the wooden warships. Behind this barricade rests a diverse group of both Confederate and Louisiana state gunboats. In addition, the defense includes schooners with drag lines designed to become entangled in the propeller wheels of Union ships. Theoretically, this tactic could have been effective, but in practice it fails. Duncan also enlists sharpshooters to hide in the Point of Woods, a swampy area just south of Fort Jackson where they attempt to shoot commanders on the decks of Union ships, a tactic that enrages the Federals. On April 13th and 14th, Federal gunboats approach the forts. Several of the gunboats are brought forward and pass most of the day by pouring a furious storm of canister and spherical case into the woods to dislodge the rebel sharpshooters. At 7.30 a.m. on April 16th, Confederate gunners inside Fort Jackson open fire. Their shells fall short, two and a half miles away from the Federal gunboats probing the fort's defenses. When the rounds begin falling closer to the gunboats during the 11 and a half hours of incessant shelling, the Federals withdraw to safety beyond the point of woods. During that day's exchange, the commanders at Fort Jackson discover their gunpowder is too weak for their shells to reach the Union vessels on the river. Later that night, Duncan reports, the enemy triangulated points below and put signal flags, preparatory to placing mortar boats. Duncan launches several patrols after the discovery of the markers to remove them, but as soon as Confederate troops tear the flags down, they are quickly replaced. On the morning of April 17th, one of the fire rafts float downriver toward the Union fleet and causes a great disturbance. Duncan gives standing orders to Captain Mitchell to send the fire rafts downriver at night, lighting the river to ensure that the Union fleet cannot sneak past the forts. The rafts proved more hazardous than beneficial to the Confederates. Most of the rafts wind up near the forts and nowhere near the Union ships, which means the defenders have to spend time putting out fires rather than fighting. The next morning, Good Friday, April 18, 1862, the Battle of Forts Jackson and St. Philip begins when the Union Mortar Flotilla, totaling 21 vessels along with several gunboats, open up a 10-hour bombardment on Fort Jackson. Union gunboats fire 2,997 mortar shells. The defenders' shots continue to fall short of their targets. At 6 a.m. on the 19th, the Union mortar boats move further into the open as more of them pass a point of woods. Confederate gunners keep the mortar boats at bay and continually drive them back to the passes, but at the end of the day, several Confederate artillery pieces within Fort Jackson lay mangled and unusable. A torrential rain falls on April 20th, raising Confederate hopes as a respite in what had become daily bombardments. The Federals seize the opportunity, however, and that night a Union gunboat drags the anchored schooners from their positions on the river. Many of the schooners become disengaged, but as the gunboats retreat, 
the fire intensifies. Captain Seymour wrote, The bombardment was unusually heavy, the enemy using time fuses and bursting the shells above the fort. Union fire continues into the night, shattering some of the wooden structures within Fort Jackson. During a brief lull in the shelling, the men inside the fort rejoiced to hear that the CSS Louisiana had arrived nearby during the night. Whittle had finally granted Duncan's request to send the ironclad into the fray, releasing it to the charge of Captain Mitchell. Even under the direst of circumstances, Duncan apparently maintains his composure. The two commanders had met in person on the 19th, when Mitchell made his position clear, under no circumstances should the Louisiana be positioned underneath the forts, nor should it participate in any aggressive action toward the enemy. Duncan still insists that the Louisiana can only be effectively used as a floating battery. Around noon on April 23rd, the Union guns slow their fire. Before sundown, Duncan writes a dispatch to Mitchell saying, The enemy has sent up a small boat and planted a series of white flags on the Fort St. Philip side, commencing about 350 yards above the Lone Tree. It is the probable position of his ships in the new line of attack which, in my opinion, he contemplates. Flag Officer Farragut raises the Red Lantern on his flagship, the 24-gun Sloop of War steamer USS Hartford. At approximately 2 a.m. on April 24th, this is used as a signal to the fleet to move past the forts. The gunboat USS Cayuga takes the lead, using the lights from the forts as a guide while the ships advance upriver in two columns. As the Union fleet makes its way through the broken barriers, Guns from both forts open fire, creating a smoky haze above the river's surface that makes aiming difficult for both Union and Confederate gunners. The Cayuga receives most of the fire and withdraws, with the Hartford taking its place in the column. Seeing the fleet staging in preparation for the attack, Duncan makes a final appeal to Mitchell to bring up the Louisiana, but to no avail. The Confederate gunboat CSS McRae and the steam ram ironclad CSS Manassas remain in position above Fort Jackson. Confederate gunners resort to watching the enemy's gun flashes to target the boats in the dense smoke. Manassas steams downriver and appears before the Union ships break for the city. Engaging the Union 10-gun paddle frigate USS Mississippi, Manassas turns to get away from its larger Union adversary but runs aground and is blasted by two heavy broadsides. A few hours after the Union vessels pass by, Flag Officer David Porter under a flag of truce approaches Fort Jackson and verbally demands the surrender of the Confederate garrisons. If Duncan rejects the demand, Porter threatens, the Union bombardment will commence at midnight. He makes good on his word when Duncan refuses to capitulate. On April 25th, Duncan requests permission from Porter for CSS McRae to take the wounded from both forts to New Orleans for medical attention. Porter agrees, and the next day a Union gunboat under a white flag drops down from above Fort St. Philip to escort McRae to New Orleans with the wounded aboard. Mitchell reports from Fort St. Philip that officials in New Orleans are negotiating for the surrender of the city. Duncan balks at the rumor and vows to maintain the defense of the forts at any cost. Meanwhile, at 2 p.m., Flag Officer Farragut formally accepts the surrender of New Orleans despite the fact that General Lovell refuses to admit defeat. Farragut sends Captain Bailey, 1st Division Commander from the USS Cayuga, to accept the surrender. There, he meets a defiant armed mob and witnesses William B. Mumford pulling down a Union flag previously raised by sailors 
of the USS Pensacola. The same day, Duncan observes a large frigate nestled behind Fort St. Philip with several small boats in tow. Union Army troops under the command of Major General Benjamin F. Butler have landed at the quarantine in the fort's rear. Porter again demands the surrender of the forts on April 27th, and Duncan once more refuses. He's still not believing the rumors of the surrender of New Orleans are true. Hoping to raise morale, Duncan composes a note of encouragement to the garrison's men, commending their bravery and resolve, considering what the men have already gone through and the rumors about New Orleans. Duncan does not know whether his troops can hold out much longer. He hopes, stressing that they are protecting their homes, families, and the Confederate cause will persuade the men to keep fighting. Despite his efforts, Duncan notices that the defenders are increasingly frustrated and weary. On April 28th, their frustration explodes into a mass mutiny. The mutineers at Fort Jackson apparently plan the insurrection for more than two days before they finally act, during which the time they signal the soldiers at Fort St. Philip in hopes of swelling the ranks. Fort Jackson's men then turn the heavy guns away from their positions seize the guards and spike the remaining guns and leave the fort with their weapons. Half the garrison walks out, leaving behind the St. Mary's cannoneers, who would stay at their post throughout the entire siege. Duncan credits Father Francis Nachin, chaplain of the forts, for calming the decision sufficiently to prevent bloodshed. With his force reduced to half its original strength, Duncan calls a council of the coastal defense officers to discuss the inevitable. He then treats with Porter for the surrender of the garrisons at both forts. Later on the 28th, Porter sails up to Fort Jackson on the USS Harriet Lane. While negotiations were pending on the Harriet Lane, Duncan wrote, it was reported that the steamer Louisiana, with her guns protruding and on fire, was drifting down the river towards the fleet. As the wreck drifts on, hugging the Fort St. Philip shore, its guns fire at random and the ironclad finally blows up. Pieces of the vessel fly through the air, killing one Union crewman on the shore and wounding several Confederates. The next day, Brigadier General Duncan, along with officers and wounded from both forts, make their way upriver to New Orleans, believing they have performed their duty to the best of their ability. The men feel no culpability in the fall of the forts. Close behind them, Flag Officer Farragut enters the city with 250 U.S. Marines from the USS Hartford to remove the Louisiana state flag from the city hall and restores order. The Battle of Forts Jackson and St. Philip ends on April 28th, when the smoke clears near the passes. The dilapidated bulks of Louisiana, General Quitman, Manassas, and Governor Moore litter the river. Giant shell holes in the fort's ramparts also reveal the destruction wrought by the Union fleet. During the attack, levees had broken, flooding the forts. At Fort Jackson, nine men lay dead and 33 wounded. Two men were killed and four wounded at Fort St. Philip. The Federals had suffered 37 killed and 147 wounded. On May 1, 1862, the capture of New Orleans is complete with the city's total surrender to the Union. In sum, the New Orleans expedition amasses an estimated 1,011 casualties, and while the fall of the city is anticlimactic, the southern port soon finds itself occupied with federal forces, most notably Benjamin Butler, who will famously crack down on Southern sympathizers and Confederate support in New Orleans. The capture of New Orleans is a huge coup for the Union war effort and will prove to be one of the first major turning points of the Civil War.